You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 185, Hebrews chapter 7. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how are you doing this week? Pretty good. Pretty good. Ready for Melchizedek again. Our boy. <laughs> this would be the shortest podcast ever. So right. you'll be referencing. Go listen to that other, other stuff. Yeah. Well, that's all the time we have for now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that's good. No, and before we get started, Mike, I just want to remind everybody that we're going to try to do a get together uh, in Boston because we'll be at the uh, uh, SBL and ETS covering the conferences. So we're aiming for Friday, November 17th in Boston somewhere. So stay tuned to that. We'll try to do a live Q&A like we did last year in San Antonio. So uh, yeah, ho- hopefully we'll get uh, like in San Antonio, we'll get a dozen or so and we'll have a good time. Yeah. Should we say who we have lined up for some of the interviews or? Yeah. I mean, we can do that. Let's see. Going back here in, into the, into my memory here. I'm not, I'll just, I'll mention a few. Uh, Hugh Ross, we're fortunate enough to be able to spend, uh, you know, what I'm hoping will be 20 or 30 minutes with Hugh Ross. I mean, he, his schedule is very chaotic and that's because, you know, he has to, he has to speak a little bit. He has to do some booth time and then people just want to talk to him. So we'll get to chat with Hugh again. It's, I, uh, Got to chat with him last year, but just, you know, one-on-one at a, at a booth. But it'll be nice to interview him and talk about his recent book, uh, John Walton. We have uh, on the schedule uh, John Golden Gay, who is uh, an Old Testament professor. Uh, Andy Nacelli has a book on the, 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 quote, higher life, you know, let go and let God uh, approach to, to the Christian life. He has a book critiquing that. I think that'll be interesting. We have, uh, I'm trying to remember their names because I haven't met them before, Gerald uh, Heastrand and Todd, I think it's Todd Wilson, um, they have a couple books that thematically are about recovering the model of the scholar pastor. You know, back in the old days, you know, a couple centuries ago, scholars were, you know, really, you know, sort of leading intellectuals and theologians. So they, they're they actually, again, trying to uh, kind of restore this model, write a lot about it. So I thought, you know, for this audience, that's going to be a, an important conversation and expose you to their work too. So that that's that's an illustration. Those are samples of what we have, and you know, some some familiar ones: David Burnett, Ron Johnson, Carl Sanders. But it'll it'll be a good time. All right, yeah, looking forward to it. Well, here we are in uh, Hebrews seven, and no, we're not going to just look like end it here. <laughs> but I will say again, by way of a retrospect. You know, we have covered uh, Melchizedek quite a bit on the podcast, and not too long ago. This is sort of part two of Christ's high priesthood. We got into the high priesthood of Christ a little earlier, episode uh, 183. In fact, uh, this, you know, the, the priesthood of Christ is going to, you know, stretch into Hebrews 10. I made that comment before, but part one, if we're calling this sort of a, a second part, the second installment is episode 183. So, you know, you could go back and listen to that. But even further back than that, not too long, but further back, we we had a whole series on Melchizedek that we had uh, the third, I think it was the third, we did four four podcasts on Melchizedek. I think the third one was episode 170, where we did Christ and Melchizedek. And we actually got into Hebrews 7 uh, a lot in that episode. So because of that, we're going to focus today on what we didn't do before. I'm going to do a little summarizing and then transition to newer material. So we're not going to repeat these prior episodes. We're just going to hit a few points real quickly by way of summary. So if you want detail, you know, episodes, you know, one really 167, I think, on through 170, 171 are all about Melchizedek. You got the episode 183 about first installment for the high priesthood. But you want the detail, go there. For today, just hitting some highlights and then getting into new stuff. And I think you'll find the new stuff pretty interesting. So let's go to the last few verses of Hebrews 6, which set up Hebrews 7, and jump in there. So Hebrews 6, 13, I'm going to read 13 through 20. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. 
So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now that, again, reintroduces this or introduces the Melchizedek idea specifically. There was a, an earlier allusion, again, in the, in the high priestly talk that we've, I mentioned just a few minutes ago before. Let's just jump right into Hebrews 7. Again, if you want to listen to the end of Hebrews 6 or the other stuff, please go there. But Hebrews 7 you know, begins this way, right on the heels of that comment that he has been made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 1 says, For this Melchizedek, the king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. But resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And that's, that finishes up with, with verse 4, at least to this point. Now, there's some old material here, again, mostly from episode 170, Melchizedek in the New Testament. There is a significant phrase, and you know, significant phrase number one, I guess we can call it, without father or mother or genealogy, neither beginning of days or end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. Now, as O'Brien commented, and I quoted this in the earlier episode, he says, these remarkable words have been understood in two significantly different ways. The first approach interprets without father or mother as divine predicates, which were well known in Hellenistic sources. Without genealogy signifies unbegotten or uncreated and therefore of divine generation. While the crucial statement without beginning of days or end of life means that he was truly God and not merely a divinized mortal. On this view, if you're going to take these things this way, O'Brien says Melchizedek is a divine figure, a heavenly being who is not part of this world. End of quote. That's from O'Brien's commentary, Letter to the Hebrews, in the Pillar series. Now, the problem, of course, as O'Brien himself points out, and we talked about, is there's no hint of that stuff in the Old Testament. It is a Second Temple period understanding that Melchizedek is a divine being, but in the Old Testament, you don't get that. Okay, there's, there's just no hint that he's anything but a guy, but a man. So we get into the second approach, again, that, that O'Brien talks about. The second approach takes the author's statements as an example of an argument from silence in a typological setting. In the first clause, without father or mother, without genealogy, it's understood in, in purely human terms within a Greco-Roman context. If that's the case, then this would discredit Melchizedek. Without father meant being illegitimate. Someone without a mother was the child of a woman of low social status. Without genealogy meant that no one or that one was disqualified from becoming a Levitical priest, according to Numbers three ten and fifteen and sixteen. So that's another perspective. If you don't take these these phrases as the language of divinity, well then you know you you might have other problems on the other side. And we talked about these things in the earlier episode. We sort of parked on the notion that the key to unraveling this language without showing disrespect to Melchizedek without saying, oh, he's illegitimate, his mom was low status, and that kind of thing. The way to unravel it and, and, and not make him a divine being, whereas the Old Testament never says that and create those problems, was really two of these words, that is, without genealogy. The point of this description, therefore, would be a priestly qualification, not that Melchizedek was a supernatural being, but that he was a priest that didn't depend, his priesthood didn't depend on a specific genealogy. That's why we, we get this talk about, we don't, we don't have a father or, or mother mentioned in the Old Testament. We don't have any, anything like that mentioned. And, and so this perspective says, well, the reason why those things are absent in the description of Melchizedek was so that no one could say, well, we have, the only priesthood that's available is the one from, you know, from the tribe of Levi and all that. If you take that stuff away, and then God calls him a priest, which he does, and again, in, in Psalm 110, and, he, and of course, in Genesis 14, then in God's mind, here is a priest 
of the Most High. Here is a priest that God approves of that doesn't need this genealogy. And that's important because the Messiah, of course, would be the son of David, not the son of Levi. And, and that's why the description, the linkage back to Melchizedek, who doesn't have any particular lineage attached to him, why that becomes significant. So O'Brien says uh, in this regard, although Melchizedek could not have qualified for the Levitical priesthood, he was a priest of God most high. And Abraham recognized this. Moreover, since Genesis says nothing about his birth or death, his priesthood is cast as having no beginning or end. It was divinely pointed. Other, that's the end of his quote. In other words, Melchizedek's priesthood, he's not described with any genealogical qualifications, no mom and dad. That's never given. So, so you know, they're, they're, we're, we're dealing with something outside of Leviticus, or excuse me, outside the, of the line of Levi that God approves of. And it also, there's no narrative in the Old Testament about Melchizedek's priesthood ever ending. When we get to Psalm 110, it's like still there. It's still in God's mind. This is a legitimate line. This is a a legitimate priestly line. And so by virtue of the absence of this information, no genealogy, it's never said to have ended. That, again, suggests to the reader, and this is what the writer of Hebrews is picking up on, that this is a priestly line that God approves of that doesn't depend on Levi and didn't have an end. It's still ongoing. And when you marry that to the son of David and some of the messianic characteristics, it makes sense because, you know, you have, as, as, as things keep going, you have this relationship, you know, between the king and the king as God's son, and then you get the incarnation later on, you know, it, it, it's sort of part of a, a sensible part of a whole package. Now, again, this is me talking now, not O'Brien or, or anybody else. I, this is the way I summarized it in the early episode. I said, the implication is that Melchizedek was still a priest of the Most High, regardless of ancestry. There's no need to worry about Jesus not being from the tribe of Levi. Okay, you call him a priest. Well, you can't do that. He wasn't a Levi. You don't have to worry about that. We don't need to worry about Levi. This is a different priesthood. It's also approved of God, and one that is, you know, is cast that way because it didn't originate with a tribe and is never described as having an end. As such, physical succession to Jesus of Nazareth isn't an issue. Because the priesthood his ministry follows wasn't linked to a lineage. It was dictated by God alone. And that, that, I think that's, again, the, the importance of this linkage back to Melchizedek. Lastly, one other line from O'Brien, he, he said, and I used this in the earlier episode, but it's worth repeating here. He says, consequently, Melchizedek foreshadows the priesthood of Christ at that point where it is most fundamentally different from the Levitical priesthood. In other words, it's not dependent on tribal lineage. Now, significant phrase number two, or significant set of ideas number two, is this line in, again, what we read here of that Melchizedek resembles the Son of God. Resembling the Son of God, he, Melchizedek, becomes a priest forever. Now, note the wording. It is Melchizedek who resembles the Son of God. The point isn't that Jesus resembles Melchizedek. Okay, It's the other way around. Melchizedek is the one who resembles the Son of God. Because Melchizedek resembles Jesus, his priesthood is to be understood as being independent of lineage and one begun by God and never terminated. And so while Second Temple Jewish texts, again, we spent a whole episode on, on those texts with Melchizedek, while those texts thought about Melchizedek in divine terms, the reason for doing so was misguided. But the notion is still valid if one sees how the Messiah was a priest according to Melchizedek's priesthood. And the Messiah not Melchizedek, was divine. In other words, the idea that Melchizedek had something to do with a divine Messiah was on target, but not because Melchizedek was more than a man. It was because Jesus, the son of David, the Messiah, he was more than a man. And Melchizedek resembles him, not the other way around. Now, we had gone over all of that, again, in earlier episodes, so I'm going to leave it there, and we're going to move on to new stuff. You know, new points of focus. And really, there's going to be two, two drill-down places in this episode when it comes to Hebrews 7. And really, they're found in, in Hebrews, the rest of the, of the chapter, Hebrews 7, 11 through 26. Now, I'm going to read all of that. That's the rest of the chapter. But I'm only going to focus on Hebrews 7, 4 through 10 in these two, these two drill-down points. Verses 11 through 26 basically derive from verses 4 and 10 or reinforce ideas about Christ's priesthood we've already discussed. You know, frankly, verses 4 through 10 is the really interesting material for today because it's new. 
Now, here's the whole remainder of Hebrews 7. So I'm going to read, again, 11 through 26 here, just so that we get it, get it in our heads. And then we'll go back to 4 through 10. Verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, quote, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, unquote. Verse 18. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. Isn't that an interesting statement? <laughs> Verse 19. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, quote, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, unquote. Verse 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. That's the whole of chapter 7. Let's go back to verses 4 through 10 and hit the first of our drill-down points. Hebrews 7, 4 to 10. Read it once more so we fix it in our minds. So how great this, see how great this man, Melchizedek, was to whom Abraham the patriarch paid a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say, this is verse 9, one might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. That's the end of verse 10. So we have a couple of items to cover here. First one isn't really transparent from verses 4 through 10, but is, is related to the content. And this question has come up in Q&A episodes before. That is the question, was Melchizedek Shem? Okay, Shem, the son of Noah. Now, Lane in his commentary writes, in the Targumic tradition, Targums were Aramaic translations of, in this case, the Old Testament. You also have New Testament Targums. That would be Aramaic translations of the Greek New Testament. But in the Targumic tradition, Melchizedek is identified as Shem, Noah's son, and it is specified that he served God, quote, at that time. Typically, or you find this in Targum Pseudo-Jonathan, in Genesis 14, 18, and, and some other sources. Now, I might as well, Targum Neophyti, again, you find it there too. So there, there are some you know, fairly significant Targums, Aramaic translations of the Old Testament, that when you hit Genesis 14, 18, they throw in, the translators throw in this idea that Melchizedek was Shem. Now, Targums, again, these specific ones that I mentioned, are dated anywhere from the 1st to the 9th century AD. So they post-date the Old Testament by centuries. Uh, they are, again, pretty, pretty loose uh, translations, but they reflect uh, some ideas that were 
around in the Jewish community, what we might think of as the rabbinic community. And so in a couple of Targums, this idea you know, leaks its way into the actual translation, even though in the Hebrew text of Genesis 14, 18, there's nothing like this. There's no, there's no connection to Shem made in the Hebrew Bible uh, specifically. Now, I've already said, again, in Q&A and other contexts, I don't think Melchizedek was Shem. I mean, there's, there's no biblical evidence for that. But nevertheless, you have it here in these sources. Now, I want to I quote from um, about the date, just so that we, we sort of, you know, give some weight to this. Um, there's a whole series put out by a liturgical press on the Aramaic Targums. You can get English translations of the Aramaic Targums and then commentaries on those Targums in this multi-volume you know, series of books. So this is from uh, Targum Neophyti in this series, Aramaic Bible, Targum Neophyti 1, that is Genesis. It's translated by Martin McNamara, who's a very well-known uh, Targumic scholar. And the editors are Cathcart, Mayer, and McNamara himself. They write this about the Targum Neophyti and then some of this other stuff about tar- Targum Pseudo-Jonathan, their dates. They write, Neophyti, part of what scholars call the Palestinian Targums, there is very strong evidence from rabbinic sources that written texts of the Targums of the Pentateuch, therefore the Palestinian Targums, existed at least in the late 3rd and early 4th centuries of our era, that is A.D., and there are indications that they were known there earlier still. So they're going to go back to the 1st century. Now they continue and say this, about Targum Pseudo-Jonathan, opinions expressed on the date of Pseudo-Jonathan range from the time of Ezra, or shortly after it, all the way to the time of the Crusades, which is a considerable range of time, range of opinions. Although Pseudo-Jonathan certainly contains ancient traditions, many recent authors argue that this Targum received its final form after the Arab conquest of the Middle East. Splansky believes that Pseudo-Jonathan dates from the 9th or 10th century. His main arguments may be summarized as follows. The reference to Adi Shah and Fatima in Pseudo-Jonathan of Genesis 21-21 should not be seen as an insertion. The source of the Midrash could not have originated before 633 CE or AD at the earliest. Again, these are, these are known entities. Pseudo-Jonathan makes use of pre and both PRE, it's, a, it's an abbreviation for a text in the Tan Khamas, a fact which points to the 9th or 10th century at the time. That's really obscure stuff. Here we get some, to something that's a little bit more interesting, a little more discernible, I would say, to a popular audience. They write, the way in which Pseudo-Jonathan represents the Midrash about Abraham's refusal to bless Ishmael in Genesis 25:11 betrays an anti-Muslim polemic. And the reference to the blemish of Ishmael and the blemish of Esau in Pseudo-Jonathan Genesis 35:22 can best be explained against the background of a world divided between Arabs and Christians. There are possible indications in other texts in Pseudo-Jonathan that they date from a time after the Arab conquest. And then he, he starts, starts talking about calendar and things like this. Basically, the point is that there's stuff in Targum Pseudo-Jonathan that contains the Shem tradition we're talking about that sort of reflect a problem with Islam. <laughs> and if that's the case, then you're talking about 5th, 6th, you know, 7th century and beyond history. And when we've got a divided Middle East. So this is why, you know, primarily when it comes to Targum Pseudo-Jonathan, that scholars, you know, argue that, look, this is, this is pretty late. It's pretty late material. It contains, you know, some older ideas that you can find in other texts, but it's, it, this is late material. The Targums are centuries, you know, at least a few centuries after the Old Testament period. Now, I'm going to read you this because I think it's kind of interesting. I'm going to read you Targum Pseudo-Jonathan of Genesis. This is what you'd actually read in this Aramaic translation of Genesis 14, uh, verses 14 through 18. This is the Melchizedek passage. Now, if you were following along in your Old Testament English translation, and I'm going to quote the English translation of Cathcart, Mayer, and McNamara, you're going to see right away, boy, there's stuff in there that I don't have in my Bible. And yeah, that's true. There is stuff in there you don't have in your Bible because they frankly feel very free to add details. <laughs> Um, This is not a text-critical issue where, oh, some Hebrew manuscripts have this extra stuff about Shem. There's actually no evidence for the stuff about Shem. They they just, they make it up. They add it. And we're going to talk about why they add it, why it made sense for them to do it. But when they created this translation, they just add material. So here we go. Targum Pseudo-Jonathan of Genesis. Genesis 14, beginning in verse 14 of that chapter. When Abram heard that his brother had been captured, 
He armed his young men whom he had trained for war, who had been brought up in his house, and they did not wish to go with him. So he chose from among them Eliezer, son of Nimrod, who was equal in strength to all 318 of them, and he pursued them as far as Dan. The night was divided for them on the way. One part fought against the kings, the other part was kept in reserve for the smiting of the firstborn in Egypt. Like, what in the world? The firstborn in Egypt? That's... Yeah, I know it's, it's hundreds of years later, but just bear with me. And this is what the Targums do. They just add stuff. They make stuff up. He arose, this is still in verse 15, he arose, he and his servants, and smote them and pursued those of them that remained until he remembered the sin that was to be committed in Dan. <laughs> Again, which is way future, which is north of Damascus. Verse 16, he brought back all the possessions. He also brought back Lot, his kinsmen, and his possessions, as well as the women and the rest of the people. Verse 17, when he returned from defeating Keterlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him at the leveled plain, which is the king's race course. 18, here we go. The righteous king, that is Shem, the son of Noah, king of Jerusalem, went out to meet Abram and brought him bread and wine. At that time, he was ministering before God most high. So that's the end of the, of the selection. So the Targum doesn't even use the term Melchizedek. He'd use his righteous king. Again, Melchizedek could be translated, my king is, is righteous. It says the righteous king, and then it, it says point blank, that is Shem, the son of Noah, the king of Jerusalem, who went out to meet Abraham. So it, it's a clear identification of Shem uh, with Melchizedek in the Targums. So you also have this in uh, early patristic sources, early church fathers. A couple of them will have this kind of stuff in it. Ephraim is one of them. Um, you'll find this. Now, I'm going to post a couple of links on the episode page for this episode. There are two articles. If you're interested in the Shem subject, you, you know you, you can get these. These are publicly accessible articles. One is by Andre Orlov, who, interestingly enough, is now David Burnett's uh, advisor at Marquette. But he has an article, a, a long essay on Second Enoch, which is also known as Slavonic Enoch. It's, it's an Enochian book that was written in ancient Slavonic. That's the language it survives in. Uh, and that references this, this idea that Shem and, Mel, and Melchizedek were the same person. There's also an article um, in, from the Biblica Journal uh, about this, and let me get the title for it because I'm going to read a, a, a brief selection from it. The title is uh, Melchizedek, Genesis 14, 17 through 20 in the Targums in Rabbinic and Early Christian Literature. So you're going to have links to both of those. If you're interested in the subject, you know, there you go. You'll, you'll, have, some, uh, you'll have some good stuff to read. So you'll, you'll, I think you'll be sufficiently entertained if you're into this, this Shem idea, again, which doesn't have biblical roots, but, you know, you, you see it in these, these kind of sources. Now, I'm going to go to that second article, which is by McNamara. I'm going to read, read a few things. You say, well, why in the world did they make this connection? And, you know, back in the Q&As that we've had before, it's basically about chronology, that how their lives overlap. So McNamara says on the 13th page of the PDF that you could get, page 13 of the article as well, he says, the biblical evidence for this idea is as follows. Abraham was 100 years old at the birth of Isaac, Genesis 21.5. Isaac was therefore 75 years old when Abraham died. Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, Genesis 19.2, and was 60 years old at the birth of Esau and Jacob, Genesis 25.25. Jacob was thus born 15 years before the death of Abraham, and consequently 50 years, 15 plus 35, before the death of Shem. Isaac died at the age of 180 years, Genesis 35.28. Shem thus lived during 100 years of Isaac's 180 and during 50 years of Jacob's lifetime, which also by definition then, if he, if, he, if he lived during the lifetime of Isaac and Jacob, he also lived during the lifetime of Abraham. And so the, the argument is that you know, he was alive and, and he, you know, surely he must have been Melchizedek. Okay, that, that, that's basically how the argument goes. So people take the chronology and they assume an identification. It, it's, it's actually that simple. Well, Shem's life overlapped with Abraham, and Abraham meets this Melchizedek guy, and, well, Shem and Melchizedek must have been the same. And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. I agree with you. I don't think it makes any sense at all, but that's what's behind it. So that idea, again, which was a tradition in 
you know, some community somewhere you know, with, within the, uh, you know, within Judaism, it leaks its way into Aramaic translations, targums of Genesis 14. And then early Christian writers who were familiar with Jewish tradition, Jewish thinking, had interact with, you know, Jews, they refer to the idea in their own writings as well. So you actually get these references in early Christian sources and in targums about Melchizedek and Shem being the same guy. Now, you say, well, it's kind of interesting. What's the harm? You know, what, why, is there anything here to, to really care about? Well, yeah, there, there may be. McNamara on page 15 has a section on the origin of the identification of Melchizedek with Shem. He writes, uh, M. Simon, again, a reference to a scholar, thinks that it was due to the embarrassment felt by Jews in view of Abraham's paying homage to Melchizedek. If Melchizedek is identified with Shem, then Abraham was merely showing deference to an ancestor. In other words, let me stop there. There are some who, you know, this is just speculation, but some scholars think, well, you know, they came up with this idea because it's kind of embarrassing to have Abraham. I mean, like, who, he, he's Abraham. Good grief. He's, he's awesome. He's our, our primary ancestor. It's embarrassing to have this guy bowing to essentially a Canaanite, you know. So, okay, let, let's identify Melchizedek with Shem. That way, Abraham is only really bowing to an ancestor. It's not so bad. Back to McNamara. He says, it's doubtful if there was any polemical, tendentious intention, anti-Christian or otherwise, in the identification. The identification of Melchizedek with Shem, in any event, may well predate Christianity. You know, you're first century, you know, you might be older than that. R. Ishmael, Rabbi Ishmael, uh, takes the identification for granted, and the texts as found in Jewish or Christian sources do not indicate any embarrassment with it. The rabbinic, targumic, and patristic texts, especially Jerome, would seem to indicate that the identification arose from chronological considerations on the biblical age attributed to Shem. Okay, that, that's what we just mentioned. Now, McNamara continues, and he observes, this is really, I think this is actually kind of interesting. He observes that when you get to rabbinical writings, there are certain rabbis that make a point of denigrating Melchizedek's priesthood or kind of demoting it, devaluing it. And that becomes really interesting because rabbinical writings, the, the, the rabbinic period as we think of it, is, is in, in line with the events of the New Testament and, of course, post-dates, continues on after the New Testament. So the suspicion among certain scholars is that the rabbinic writings, you know, certain rabbis who wrote about Melchizedek and even, you know, may or may not have accepted this Shem idea, they make a point to sort of take Melchizedek's priesthood down a few pegs. And scholars suspect that when they do that, they are shooting at Jesus, okay, because Jesus to Christians was identified with this priesthood. Let me just read a section from McNamara's article. He writes, it has been noted above that in accepting the identification of Melchizedek with Shem, Rabbi Ishmael did not have any polemical point to make. The same cannot be said of his statement which follows immediately on this regarding Melchizedek's priesthood. This, he says, was taken away by God from Shem, in other words, from Melchizedek. You know, Melchizedek lost his priesthood and given to Abram. That's what the rabbis taught. Shem, or Melchizedek, was a priest, but his descendants were not. God transfers the priesthood of Shem, or Melchizedek, to Abraham and addresses Psalm 110 to him. So the, let me just stop there. The rabbis just interpreted Psalm 110 as being, ref, as, as being spoken to Abraham. So they, he, God transfers the priesthood of Shem to Abraham and addresses Psalm 110 to him. Sit on my right hand, as he also does in Psalm 110.4. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, which is interpreted as meaning on account of what Melchizedek said, you know, so on and so forth. You know, this is why you, and again, the rabbis imagine that, that the speaker in the psalm is speaking to Abraham. You, you're a priest forever on account of what this Melchizedek guy did. That, that's how they read the passage. Now back to McNamara. The reason for the demotion of Melchizedek's priesthood is seen in Melchizedek having blessed Abram before he uttered his blessing to God Most High. As Petakoski observes, there can be no doubt that Rabbi Ishmael's reference to Melchizedek is polemical. But against whom is Rabbi Ishmael's polemic directed? Let me just stop there. So the idea is that the, the rabbis base this demotion idea on the fact that Melchizedek blesses Abraham before the, the comment about blessing, you know, the, the most high. And so God was mad and God said, okay, because you did that, I'm going to take your priesthood and give it to Abram. You know, Shem, Melchizedek, you know, you're, you're not going to have any more priests after you. 
I'm going to transfer it to Abraham. And then Psalm 110 preserves this transference of the priesthood over to Abraham. Well, you see what that does. You know, it, it, you know it, it's, it's going to be a, a slam you know, to Christians who are identifying Jesus with the priesthood of Melchizedek. So back to McNamara, he says, one possibility is that his target is the Christian understanding of Melchizedek's priesthood, particularly as presented in the epistle to the Hebrews, spe- specifically Hebrews 7 with the use of Genesis 14, 17 through 20 and Psalm 110, 4. L. Ginsberg believed that it was very likely directed against the Christians, such as the author of Hebrews 7, 1 through 3, and especially Justin, Justin Martyr, uh, on account of his dialogue with Trypho, specifically directed against the Christians who took Melchizedek to be a type, a foreshadowing of Jesus, you know, unquote. So I'll let me see if I want to bring out, say anything else there. Okay, one, one more paragraph. Others, I mean, we, got, we have to be fair here. So, so some scholars say we might have a Christian polemic going on here. We want to distance the priesthood of Melchizedek from Jesus. Very, very possible. There are other scholars, though, who, who will go off in a different direction. I'm, I'm mentioning this again out of fairness and also for those of you who might find this interesting. Others do not consider such a conclusion necessary or warranted. They go a different way. The polemic may have originally been directed against a Jewish or Samaritan misuse of Psalm 110, possibly the Hasmoneans, such as Simon. In 1 Maccabees 14, 35 and 41, we read, The people saw Simon's faithfulness and the glory that he had resolved to win for his nation. They made him their leader and high priest. The Jews and their high priest resolved that Simon should be their leader and high priest forever until a trustworthy prophet should arise, unquote. Psalm 110, in particular, Psalm 110.4, would present legitimization for the Hasmonean union of royalty and kingship in one person of Simon and his successors. Now, I'll I'll just end the quote there. If you know a little bit about intertestamental history, that was offensive to a lot of Jews, what the Hasmoneans did there. And so some scholars would say some of the rabbinic talk, you know, later on, you know, New Testament era, first century and forward. Um, might have been aimed at, at the Hasmoneans. Maybe this is why they they sort of knocked the Mel- knocked Melchizedek's priesthood down a few notches. And they said these polemic things about it. So it's either the Christians or, again, the Hasmonean dynasty could be one or the other. And you probably had Jews that thought one thing or the other. You know, And scholars, of course, you do that have, think one thing or the other. But the, the important point is that if you, can, if, if you want to say that Shem and Melchizedek are the same a, you don't have any specific biblical evidence to say that, and B, you ought to know what you're getting yourself into, <laughs> because that whole idea was used by the rabbis to denigrate Jesus, his high priestly identification in the book of Hebrews. So know what you're getting into. Now, our second drill down point is, I think, the more obvious of this. As we read Hebrews 7, verses 4 through 10, you get to verses 9 and 10. I'll read them again. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. There are all sorts of problems here. Basically, the question is, how in the world was Levi, quote, in the loins of his ancestor, that is Abraham? Lots and lots of problems. But let's start with the mainstream view of this passage. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to telegraph it this way. The mainstream view tries really hard to avoid the most difficult question. Okay, it just does. Now, the mainstream view argues that Levi wasn't really in the loins of his ancestor. It says that language is meant to convey the idea of corporate solidarity between Abraham and his descendants. Put another way, it wants to claim the superiority of Levi's priesthood has a, quote, basis in history, unquote, while denying that the tithe payment of Levi ever actually occurred in real time, because Levi, of course, hadn't been born yet. Now, here's a sample. If you think I'm overstating this, here's a sample. This is from Lane's commentary, Word Biblical Commentary. He writes this on page 170. The writer clearly recognized his statement that Levi had paid a tithe to Melchizedek was not literally true, because at the moment in primal history when Abraham met Melchizedek, Levi was yet unborn. Nevertheless, the statement that Levi had himself paid the tithe was true in an important sense indicated by the expression de Abraham through Abraham, which immediately follows. The corporate solidarity that bound Israel to the patriarch implied that Levi was fully represented in Abraham's action. Therefore, Levi's status relative to Melchizedek was affected by Abraham's relationship to that personage, 
Consequently, the superiority of Melchizedek over the Levitical priesthood is not mere, merely theoretical, but has a basis in history. Not gonna, that's the end of the quote. Catch the basis in history. Well, so in other words, Abraham's existence, that would have to be the basis in history. Abraham's existence makes Melchizedek's priesthood superior to Levi's because Levi was imagined to be in Abraham, but he wasn't really there. But that's okay since Abraham existed. It doesn't matter that the payment never occurred because Levi wasn't there. It was just presumed to work that way. Now, it might sound easy to poke fun at that, but let's think about it a little bit. Does anything in the text actually kind of support it? Now, some commentators suggest that one of the verb forms in Hebrews 7, 9 makes the view that Levi wasn't really there the correct view. Okay, now Hebrews 7, 9 says, one might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. Now, the verb translated paid is a Greek perfect passive. It's dede katotai, perfect passive indicative third singular for you Greek geeks out there, okay? It's a Greek perfect passive, and so the verse could be translated this way. Levi himself, who received tithes, had tithes paid for him by Abraham. Now, that sounds like it nails down the representative idea. Hey, Levi doesn't have to be there. Abraham paid tithes on his behalf, and so he doesn't really have to have existed yet. So the, the mainstream view is really based on this notion, and the notion is, in turn is based upon this Greek perfect passive verb form, that Levi had tithes paid for him. In perfect passive, perfect pa a perfect uh, you know tense in Greek is an action in the past that has you know continuing ensuing results. All right, and passive it means that there's an outside actor. So this is the basis for the mainstream view. Now that sounds pretty good, but there's a problem. It ignores the next verse. It ignores verse ten, which says, "Quote for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him." <laughs> So it sounds wonderful in verse 9. Hey, there's a grammatical argument to be made here for the mainstream view. Yeah, well, let, let's not look too closely at verse 10 because that has Levi in the loins of his ancestor. That's the problem. Now, B.F. Westcott, who really deftly handles the passive in Hebrews 7, 9, when he gets to verse 10, he just basically says a lot of blather. Okay, he, he basically obfuscates. I'm going to use him as an example, you know, because he does a really neat job pointing out the perfect passive. And then he gets to verse 10, he writes this. The repetition of the phrase, which occurs again in the New Testament only in Acts 2.30, that is this, this idea about being in the loins. Okay, in, in Acts 2.30, it's, there's, it literally says to set one from his loins on the throne. So this, this idea only occurs there. But that, this phrase emphasizes the idea of the real unity of Abraham's race in the conditions of their earthly existence. By this teaching, a mystery is indicated to us into which we can see but a little way, a final antithesis in our being. We feel at every turn that we are dependent on the past and that the future will depend in a large degree upon ourselves. This is one aspect of life and is not overlooked in Scripture. At the same time, it does not give a complete view of our position. On the one side, our outward life is conditioned by our ancestry. On the other side, we stand in virtue of our spirit in immediate personal connection with God. Each man is at once an individual of a race and a new power in the evolution of the race. That's the quote. That's the commentary on verse 10. It basically just says a lot of stuff elegantly, but it really doesn't say anything. It doesn't address the problem. So again, basically, the commentators, again, who argue for the representational view, to use Guthrie's words, that Abraham's payment of tithes could be transferred to his descendant Levi. They do so on the basis of verse 9 because of the perfect passive, and then they never deal with the quote still in the loins of the ancestor, of his ancestor in verse 10. That is the fundamental problem. Verse 10 is the fundamental problem. So here's essentially the mainstream verdict. You presume that the language of verse 10 is about, you know, the, you, let, me, let me just say that again. You, you presume that the language of verse 10 about still being in the loins of his ancestor doesn't deserve a whole lot of attention. It's just part of expressing the idea of verse 9, that Abraham represented his ancestor, or that Abraham's ancestor would have done the same thing as Abraham did if he had been there. 
that's where you have to go. The question before us, therefore, is how to take Hebrews 7.10 seriously. If you don't go with a representational view, that it's just, oh, it's just another way of saying what's in verse 9. If you don't do that, you more or less deflect the attention away from verse 10. What do, you, what do we do with it? And again, we get all sorts of problems here. Let, let's just start with a question. Did the writer of Hebrews, okay, and other original New Testament writers and readers, people living at this time, did they believe that Levi, a son of Jacob, existed as a pre-born person in the loins of his great-grandfather Abraham? Did they believe that? In other words, was Levi really there in Abraham's loins? That's the question. And that's the question that commentators basically nearly universally don't even think about. They don't even raise it because it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an edgy question. But it's, it's a quite understandable question. Did they believe that or not? Instead, we get, oh, don't worry about verse 10. It's just part of expressing verse 9 that Abraham and Levi were identified. I'm sorry, but that, that, that's really, for me anyway, that's just really not satisfactory. Now, today, we would say, with pretty secure scientific justification, that personal existence requires embodiment. Again, this is, we, we can't really perceive it any other way if, if we're looking, for, if we're trying to think scientifically. That requires materiality, which materiality naturally comes from two genetic contributors, a man and a woman. You can't have human embodiment without that, normally anyway. I mean, now there are other ways given like cloning and synthetic biology, but, but just normally. You can't have human, a, a, a full human being you know, with embodiment, with materiality, any other way than by two genetic contributors, a man and a woman. Consequently, Hebrews 7, 9, and 10 can quite easily be read as a quaint, completely unscientific idea if the writers really believed Levi was there and if we're evaluating on scientific terms. So now we have another question that needs answering, one that some listeners might think is easily answerable, but it comes at something of a theological cost. Here's the question. If this passage suggests that the writer believed you could have an actual human person existing prior to birth, think about that. If, if Levi really was there, he really was in the loins of Abraham. That means he existed prior to birth or prior to embodiment. Then how do we avoid the conclusion that, on one hand, this is patently unscientific, how do we avoid that conclusion without requiring the doctrine of pre-existence of the soul or contradicting other points of biblical theology? In other words, can we argue that the Bible has a concept of person that doesn't involve embodiment? The short answer is, well, maybe, or yeah, you can do that. But if, if you affirm that, it produces pre-mortal, that is, pre-embodied existence, what we typically think of today as pre-existence. You know, we could also call it maybe non-terrestrial embodied existence, you know, some, some form. I mean, this is, this is where you, what you're getting at. If you, if you assent, again, to this idea that Levi was actually there, it, it's not just a if if we're talking about physically there, then we've got a real problem because then we've got a we've got a scientific error. We've got a scientific thing that that just can't be. But if you say, well, maybe Levi was there without a body. Maybe you can have persons. Maybe the Bible lets us have persons without bodies. Then we could say Levi was there, but we don't have to get into this. Oh, you got to have two you know genetic contributors because that's biology. But we're not dealing with biology here. We're just saying Levi was there, like in the soul the the immaterial essence of Levi was there in Abraham. We have, we have, we have Levi as a person there without a body. Does the scripture allow us to speak of persons without bodies? And if it does, if we say, if we answer that question, yes, how do we avoid pre-existence of the soul? Because that has problems too, or at least that's the way it, that doctrine has been perceived. Listeners might know that in the history of Christian theology, that position, pre-existence of the soul, has been declared a heresy for about, oh, I don't know, it's not 2,000, you know, let's call it 1,500 years. <laughs> okay. So again, th this is why, there, there are reasons why people, why, why Christian theologians don't want to go to pre-existence of the soul. They're, they're, they, they have problems with it, and we're going to talk about what those are. But that's sort of the, you know, the, the rock and the hard place that we're at here. Now, how might we argue this idea biblically and sort of get Hebrews 7, 9, and 10 off the hook? for being unscientific. You know, we don't have to worry about biology, but also workable in some way that allows the writer to believe that Levi was really there. How do we do that? 
again, you know, we're, just, we're going to try to noodle the problem. Let's start by asking, what's an actual human person in biblical thought? And I blogged a lot about this in biblical anthropology. You could go to my website and look that up, and you're going to get a whole series on what, what's personhood in, in, the, in the Bible. The Old Testament is pretty clear that in biblical theology, personhood is the combination of material body, whatever the form, and animate spirit. You have material plus immaterial. That makes a whole person. So Adam, or Adam, humankind, if you want to take it that way, became a living being when animated by God's breath. You have Genesis 2.7. Let me read it to you. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Okay? That description is euphemistic for the act of God in making humans animate beings. The language describes soul or immaterial part of the person because each successive human doesn't need to have God breathe into him. So we can't say that this is how every soul, every person comes into being. We don't have God like somewhere breathing. God doesn't have lungs for one thing, but you get the idea. You know, we, we don't have each person born because God, you know, breathes into them. We don't have that described in the Old Testament. We have it described with Adam, Adam, and then thereafter, humans reproduce. They're, they're, they're made to reproduce. So the language, again, is, is euphemistic for the fact that God made humans animate life forms. That, that's, that's really what it means. The description you know, isn't about each successive person needing to have God breathe into him like, like they did Adam. The description also isn't about consciousness per se. Because people who are asleep or in a coma can rightly still be said to be alive. The contents of the womb are alive before evidence of cognition is revealed or possible. I mean, it's still a living thing. A living entity whose DNA says human is by definition a living human, no matter how hard our culture wants to deny the obvious logic of that. I would also say that the language of Genesis 2-7 is not describing a special, immaterial part of humans, because the phrases breath of life and living soul are both used to describe animate animal life. Breath of life is used to describe animals in Genesis 1.30, Genesis 6.17, Genesis 7.15 and 22. That is just a sampling. And living soul is a phrase, the nefesh chaya, to describe animals. It's used to describe animals in Genesis 1.21, 2.19, 8.21, 9.10, so on and so forth. It's actually pretty common. Genesis 2.7 and other parts of Genesis are simply saying, hey, human life is here because God made it. He made the flesh, and then he animated it. He made it in such a way that life would be, would be able to reproduce, too. That's how we get humanity. Now, the point is that you need two parts in Old Testament thinking, material and immaterial, to have a full human person. You certainly can't maintain that a corpse is a person, although the word for person or self, nefesh, which is often translated soul, is actually used to describe a corpse or a body, Leviticus 21.1. 2111, 224. Now, the reason that happens is it ought to be familiar to us. Anybody who's been at a funeral knows that we still think of the body in the coffin as the person we knew. The body takes on the person's identity in, in those kind of contexts. But the body only, having only the flesh, only the corpse there, really isn't the person. And we know that. So you can't really say you have a person when you just have a corpse. But can we say that we have a person without embodiment? Okay, that might help argue that Levi was inside the loins of his father, having nothing to do with biology, because it has nothing to do with embodiment. Now, example, 1 Samuel 28, 13, you have the disembodied Samuel appear and have a conversation with Saul. You have Moses and Elijah at the transfiguration. Now, here's the question. Do they have bodies? Well, they're visible as men, but does that mean that, that we have embodiment here? Or is that just a phantom visualization that is nevertheless really them? In other words, is it just visual or is it, is it actual embodiment? Not quite the same thing. Now, it seems to be the case, because we don't really have anything, any other way to argue it in context, that what, what we have in 1 Samuel 28, 13, the transfiguration, Moses and Elijah, we have just a visual representation that was truly those individuals, but we don't actually have embodiment. We, we just don't have that in the context. But that's muddled by the fact that the Bible has spirit beings who can assume actual corporeal embodiment, like angels, okay? But perhaps that's an attribute or ability that doesn't really apply to post-death human persons like Samuel and Moses and Elijah. Maybe it's better to speak of personhood continuing on after death without embodiment. You see where I'm going here. Maybe, and this will sound odd to us because we must have embodiment for identity, at least 
in our human experience. Maybe scriptural portrayals like that of Moses and Elijah at the Transfiguration just tell us that they're still persons and they're with the Lord, that Peter, James, and John were essentially shown a form that wasn't really embodied, but it was still them. It was still Moses and Elijah, but they, had, they, had, they, they were visualized. Now, that seems workable from the scriptural data. You still have a person. You have a person without a body. But can we have the same idea, a human person without embodiment, before birth instead of after death? Because all these examples are after death. Can we have human personhood without embodiment before birth, before mortal life on earth? If that can be established, then we have a workable solution for Hebrews 7.10, at least in theory. Levi could have really been there if we divorced the language from biology and from any embodiment at all. What would be better is the notion of pre-existence apart from any embodiment. That's where we're, we're sort of angling for here. Now, I'm sure many listeners know that the idea of pre-existence like this is very controversial. You Noted know, before, again, I think, I think the idea is on the table. We'll see why. But, you know, 98, 99% of Christian theologians, evangelical or otherwise, will call the whole idea aberrant or even label it heretical as though, as though they're supposing everybody in the early church agreed on the matter, which they didn't. Uh, I've mentioned that the book by Givens, When Souls Had Wings, Pre-Mortal Existence in Western Thought, it's quite good. I'm actually going to, if we have time, I'm actually going to read you a little bit from it about Augustine, because the point needs to be made that, yeah, just about everybody you'd talk to would say, well, that's heresy. But guess what? Augustine didn't reject the idea. It's commonly thought that he did, but he only rejected a certain form of it. There were lots of people in the early church that, that took this seriously, that like this was on the table. It was a possibility as an explanation for the origin of the soul, pre-existence, you know, pre-mortal existence, real persons without bodies. Now, just because people fear the idea, presuming it's heresy, they, they might say, oh, Mike, this is just a silly rabbit trail. The language is just about corporate solidarity or ancestral solidarity. It makes no actual claim to personal existence before birth. Don't worry about Hebrews 7.10. Well, none of that's news to me, but that isn't the question that needs attention. There's certainly solidarity being struck in Hebrews 7, 9, and 10. But the real question is, what's the basis for it? The basis is Levi paying tithes, quote, while still being in the loins of his ancestor. I mean, it's something we need to think about. Again, let's think of it, uh, uh, take another little, little sort of sidestep here and think about another little angle. If the writer wasn't saying Levi was really there in the loins of Abraham, and so Levi didn't really pay tithes to Melchizedek through Abraham because he didn't actually exist yet. That's, you know, Lane's view. We read it. If the writer's saying it, Levi wasn't really there, he didn't really pay tithes because he didn't exist yet, is Levi's priesthood really inferior to Melchizedek's? If Levi was never actually there in any way, how does the claim stand? Now, I can't help thinking that commentators ought not to presume that people in the first century or earlier would have thought the way they do, the way we do as moderns. Would ancient people really have rejected the idea that Levi was actually there in the loins of Abraham in some way that didn't require embodiment of any kind? Personally, I'd like some evidence that, that the writer of Hebrews would never have had that thought. I'd like some evidence for that, rather than just us assuming it, rather than just commentators assuming it. I think it's especially needed because we actually have evidence to the contrary from both the Old Testament and Second Temple Judaism. You can actually find things said, things written about this notion of non-terrestrial, pre-mortal pre-existence. I'll cite one biblical example. Okay, you, they're, they're, This isn't the only one, but I'll, I'll give you this one. Just think about the passage. It's not going to nail anything down because you can look at it a different way, and I'll get to that. But think about this passage. This is the call of Jeremiah. It should be familiar to a lot of, a lot of listeners. Now, the word of the Lord came to me saying, this is Jeremiah 1, 4, and 5. Word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, reading this passage as pointing to preexistence is possible. I mean, it is possible to read that and think that what we're reading there is that Jeremiah existed before he got in the womb. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. How can God know, know a, a, a person who's not a person, who doesn't exist? And you, you could look at it that way and ask those questions and, and say, well, Jeremiah 1, 4, and 5, you know, I, I could see how that would teach preexistence you know, without embodiment. 
But the language could also be read as indicating just sort of a generic statement about God's omniscience. Well, God knows everything. God knows everything ahead of time. That's all it means. And, you know, I have to be fair. Yeah, you can read it that way too. But there are some, again, who read this passage and other passages as pointing to pre-existence that didn't require a body. L let me ask this question. Why is it not read as pre-existence? What are we afraid of? Do we not read it as pre-existence because some early church thinkers just didn't like it? You know, honestly, for a lot of people, yeah, that, that, that's why we don't read it as pre-existence, because we just don't want to go there. Now, honestly, that's not an acceptable answer in and of itself. Most of scholarship on pre-existence sort of sidesteps this question. It talks about Christ's pre-existence. Again, that's, that's a good topic. It's important. But a lot of sources really sidestep this. There are some exceptions. Now, if you are a subscriber to my newsletter, again, just go to drmsh.com, right-hand column, click on the link for the newsletter and subscribe. At the bottom of every newsletter issue, there is a link to an archive of podcast articles that you can get to for free. I'm going to put a 1966 dissertation in that folder. In the title of the dissertation, it's by Robert Gerald Hammerton Kelly, is The Idea of Preexistence in Early Judaism, A Study of the Background of New Testament Theology. Now, a lot of it is going to be talking about Jesus and preexistence, but there are parts of that, that dissertation that get into the notion in, in Judaism and drawing on some Old Testament passages about persons preexisting, about objects preexisting, like the Torah. There, there was this sort of preexistence category for things in Judaism. Now, why don't Christian theologians take preexistence seriously today? I mean, they can, they can read this stuff, and you know, this isn't like secret knowledge here. You can go get, get this stuff and find it. Why don't we do that? I've already answered the question. It's basically because of church tradition. Why didn't some early church thinkers, why didn't some early church people, theologians, why did they, uh, why did they not embrace preexistence? Why did they reject it? The real answer to this is because of the flawed thinking about Romans 5.12. I'm not going to drift into Romans 5.12 here. If you go up to my website, drmsh.com, put in Romans 5.12, you're going to get lots of material. Most Christian traditions teach that Romans 5.12, and I'll read the verse to you in the ESV, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned or other, for other translations will say, so that all sinned. Most Christian traditions say that that verse teaches inherited guilt, okay? Inherited guilt, that Adam sinned and the rest of humanity, either he represented them all, in other words, God makes us all guilty for what somebody else did, or we were, quote, in Adam. We were put there, we were created, you know, there to, to be in, you know, we were, we were there pre-existing in Adam, or somehow existing is probably a better way to say it, because people don't want to go to pre-existence. And we inherit his guilt, because we, we somehow sinned with him. Now, because of that, because this idea is drawn from Romans 5.12, and I hope you notice that the verse never actually says that. It says what is inherited by Adam, because of Adam's sin, is death. It doesn't say sin. It doesn't say guilt. Okay? Romans 5.12 really sort of steers this bus. It, it drives the bus. And because people thought this in the early church about Romans 5.12, that we have inherited guilt, they had to balance things like our relationship to Adam, where does the soul come from because it's the soul that's sinful, okay? We, we inherit guilt. How is sinfulness passed on, transmitted? What about predestination? What about free will? They, they had to struggle with all of these topics. And if guilt is part of, the, part of the way this gets discussed, it gets kind of freaky to have preexistence. When you say, why? Well, if the souls preexist their birth, okay, their entrance into mortality, mortal life, how do they become sinful? Do they get plopped in there? You know, does God say, hey, you, soul number 14, okay, you go over, that, that's the body I'm assigning you, you go in there, and then somehow, through flesh, you're going to, like, absorb or inherit guilt, because now you're in flesh. Like, like, like how does flesh produce a bad 
quality, a bad attribute of the soul, when the soul preexisted and didn't have it. Well, that was nice of you, God. You sent me to the body, and now I'm, now I'm condemned. How is God good? What, what, did that, what did that soul do at all? He wasn't even in Adam from the beginning in that reconstruction. There's lots of different you know, ways to parse this. In the early church, I'm just giving you an illustration of why it, one reason it could be problematic. You had the same idea for the origin of the soul uh, called creationism, where, where traditionism said that the soul is created by the human parents. And then, of course, then the, the, the conundrum there is, well, how can biology like create an immaterial thing? How can the material create something that's immaterial? It's just kind of weird. Creationism had the, the, the problem of, well, okay, God just creates the soul on the spot. We don't have preexistence. He creates each soul on the spot, puts them in there. But then God has to create them guilty because you can't really inherit guilt from biology. You know that you had all these, these problems floating around, and, and the discussion was steered by a certain understanding of Romans 5.12. Now, again, this book, When Souls Had Wings, I'm not going to take time uh, to, to read from it. I, I, I'll have to think about it. I could probably you know, photocopy a couple of pages and put them up. But I want people to see. I want people to, who are listening to this podcast to realize, and I'm gonna, I use Augustine in, in the pages I was going to read, but we're getting, we're getting pretty long here. Augustine is such a, an important figure, a central figure. I want people to see that even in the course of his writings, he puts all of the views of the origin of the soul on the table and says, you know what? We just can't really know, and they're all worth discussing. Now, he objected to origin's particular take, or he didn't want to sound too much like Origen, because Origen had other doctrinal problems, and he eventually gets anathematized. So Augustine's problem is that he has to steer clear of Origen, but he sees the weaknesses of the other views. And so what he eventually actually decides, and you know, we have to throw Pelagianism in here, you know, the, the whole controversy over free will, because Augustine wanted guilt to be inherited he wanted predestination. He didn't like, you know, the, the whole free will, you know, take too much free will. And so where, where Augustine actually lands is he lands with a, a tradition view, despite its problems, because that view allows him the most latitude to argue for predestination and human transference of guilt. He never actually comes out, and again, I'll, I'll put the pages on the website. He never actually comes out and says preexistence is an unworkable, terrible, heretical idea. He doesn't do it. But yet his opinion, veering away from that and the opinion of others, has been construed as taking preexistence completely off the table. And again, as I've said before on the podcast, I think it should be on the table. I'm not going to pretend you know, that, that we have all the answers here. But by way of you know wrapping this up, I want people to learn this. You know, who listen to the podcast, the issue should always be what can the text sustain. The issue shouldn't be what did Augustine say, what did Calvin say, what did Luther say, and you know those guys say lots of good things. Sometimes I think they say lots of kind of bad things, or truly bad things. But that isn't the question. Okay, the, the question should be what does the text sustain. So to wrap up here, again, what about Levi being really there in the loins of his father? I think that is a possibility. I don't see any evidence, and I haven't been shown any evidence, that biblical writers would have dismissed the idea out of hand. And I think that's because you have, again, these instances where, if I can say it this way, embodiment, or we don't quite need it to still be talking about persons. The clear examples are post-death, and we have to ask ourselves, well, can we use the, the post-death examples to talk about pre-birth? You know, and that's when you get into passages like Jeremiah 1. You get into pre-existence passages. The text could be read that way. And if we want to go that direction, that might help us deal with Hebrews 7.10. That's my point today. The text could allow this. We should not dismiss it because we just don't think that way. You know, I'm not dismissing the idea of corporate solidarity between Abraham and Levi. That's certainly true. Again, the que that's not the question. The question is, what is the basis for it? And what do we do with the language of verse 10? I'm suggesting we shouldn't just fold the language of verse 10 into verse 9 and just say, let's not worry about it. Let's not worry about the details of verse 10. 
I, I just don't think that's an honest way to proceed. And I, and I don't think that it can be demonstrated that biblical writers would not have thought that Levi was actually there somehow. So for me, I don't take Romans 5.12 the way most people do. I don't have a problem with preexistence per se. I can't say that Scripture teaches the idea with certainty. It might teach it. If it did, that could account for the language of Hebrews 7.10. We could argue Hebrews 7.10 is sort of like Jeremiah 1. It reveals something God knew and revealed about someone existing, but not yet born. And it reflects a verdict, that is, Levi's priesthood is inferior to Christ and Melchizedek's, that has its basis in that knowledge and in the real existence of Levi prior to birth. In other words, it takes Hebrews 7.10 seriously. The solidarity between Abraham and Levi is based on a metaphysical truth that could be, could be attached to events on earth. That's what I'm saying. Now, if we don't take that view, we're either left with the consensus view that God more or less transferred Abraham's payment to Levi, and Hebrews 7.10 doesn't have a real-time meaning in any historical sense. It's just figurative language or something like that. It's not historically or metaphysically true. The language is just meant only to convey the principle of solidarity. So you either take that view or you take the one I just articulated a minute or so ago instead of it. But again, the question should always be, what can the text sustain? How do we think about the text in its own context? And what can it sustain in terms of interpretation? All right, Michael, that was a little bit more than uh, referring back to your old podcast. So I guess <laughs> yeah. that was better than expected. All right, Mike, well, we'll get our listeners out on this. Uh, over the next week or two, we'll be releasing our conference podcast. So um, I'll try to get those out as we do them. But uh, the next week and the week after that will be filled with conference interviews and hopefully our live Q&A. So be looking for that. And then we'll pick up Hebrews uh, after that again. And uh, with that, Mike, I just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.